Well, Dan McClory joins us now. He's the managing director and head of the China Department for Bowsted Securities. You are a well-traveled man. I thought you were going to be in New York, and there you are in Irvine, California. You surprise me every time. Look, we've, there's a million things we could talk about at the end of the first week of two sessions, but I've picked four of them. First of all, this week, China lowered growth targets and introduced tax cuts. Do you think that's just pragmatic economies, or is it a recognition of economic headwinds in the future? What do you say? I'd say it's really both. I mean, clearly, growth is slowing. It's still at a tremendous pace if it's going to hit 6%. You know, most developed nations would give their left arms for that. Uh, but it's also in recognition of there have to be resources put into all sectors of the economy, especially the private sector. So I, I think, again, pragmatically, both of these elements are coming together, and I think they will contribute to energizing the economy to some degree. And, and it needs it right now. It frankly needs it. It is ironic, though, isn't it, that growth, even soft growth of a target between 6 and 6.5 percent, other countries would die for that, absolutely give their right arms for it. Yep. I, I, I mean, we have been conditioned to these, you know, outsized growth rates. And, you know, so when, when it starts to come off just a little bit, then there, it's, it's interpreted as headwinds. And, and don't get me wrong, there's, there's economic challenges in China, like in every country in the world. Um, but clearly, 6% growth can, uh, can help overcome a lot of that. Mm. Now, what about talk at the two sessions of increased encouragement for private enterprise? Do you think that there's worry within the United States in particular that it is just talk, that it's the sort of things you say when you're giving a speech at two sessions, but nothing much will flow from it? Well, you know, the, the flip side of increased incentives for private enterprise is what we heard about in, in, in our prior piece, which is the state-owned enterprises, right? So clearly the state-owned enterprises are seen as getting uh, a disproportionate share of resources. It could be capital, it could be other forms of support. So, so there's a lot of internal pressure and encouragement within China to start shifting capital primarily from the people that have it to the people that don't. And I think it was really interesting at the two sessions that uh, Pony Ma who is the founder of Tencent, he came with several proposals. Uh, one of them was about the industrial internet, and he's built an extremely successful private company, literally from nowhere. Uh, and then he talks about the Greater Bay Area, which of course involves uh, Hong Kong, Shenzhen, and Zhuhai and Macau. And there's a guy there called uh, Calvin Choi, who runs a company named AMTD, that's really an entrepreneurial, fintech, visionary leader um, that's moving the needle. So I, I think you're gonna see more emphasis on these private sector entrepreneurs that are successful and can make things happen, um, asking for and being given resources to go out and really improve the greater good. And that will happen quickly, you think, more or less immediately? Well, in certain industries, John, it already has. I mean, let's, let's look at fintech. Let's look at digital payments. Right. You know, China has gone from you know, not accepting credit cards to not caring about credit cards because they lead the world in cashless payment systems. I mean, this is something that seems preposterous, like completely leapfrogging a step that everybody else in the world has had to take in this progression. So the innovation is there, the markets are there, the potential is there, the, the realizable opportunities are there, as, as many outstanding private sector companies in China have shown. Right. So I think a little more encouragement, a little more resource, and, and there's no telling what can be done. Now, looking a long way into the future, despite the cancellation of the one-child policy, there does seem to be a reluctance for families to have two children. Now, as far as I know, this didn't really come up at two sessions, but I think it's an interesting talking point, because according to the Guardian newspaper, this could lead to a potential demographic crunch of many old people by as soon as 2050. What are your thoughts on that? John, I think it's, it's a tremendous trend that's developing. And it's, it's both challenge and opportunity. You know, when, I'll use Western names, but when John and Mary grew up in China, you know, each of them <laughs> had their two parents and their four grandparents. So each of them had essentially six people making sure they went to the best schools, got the best jobs, made sure they got a home, got a good start in life. Well, now, as they've come together as a couple, John and Mary maybe decided to have one kid or not have any kids because they want to take care about themselves for a while. But now you've got 12 people that they have to look after. So that pyramid inverts. And now on Johnny and Mary's shoulders, you've got 12 people that need to be looked after. What does that mean in terms of opportunity? Convalescent care, retirement homes, um, medical care, private health care, all kinds of support services that really didn't have to exist in the past, not because Johnny and Mary don't have 
filial piety anymore and don't care about their elders. They completely care about their elders, but they want to look after themselves too. So I think you're going to see lots of new industries that in the West are prevalent uh, that are going to come into play in China just to support that inverted pyramid. How very interesting. Look, finally, the U.S. ambassador to China is telling the Wall Street Journal this weekend that the two sides, China and the U.S., are not close enough for a deal signing ceremony at the end of March. You know, we've had Larry Kudlow saying that fantastic progress was made. We've had other people talking up these trade talks. But he says a deal is not there to be signed yet. And yet, President Xi is going to be just around the corner, really, in Europe at the end of the month. He's visiting Italy. What, what, what do you right. think is going on there? Very careful and patient planning. There's no question, like we heard from your colleagues earlier in the show, that a lot of back and forth is taking place. There have been three major coming together of high-level delegations to sort this out. So it's definitely going to happen. I think Ambassador Branstad is setting expectations. So if there doesn't happen to be a month-end meeting of Mr. Xi and Mr. Trump, right. that the expectation is already there. But here's, here's the important part. Both sides, they don't want to have another negotiation. They want a signing ceremony. They want to say we've agreed on things. So in the background and in the foreground, all of these details are being worked out. So when they do come together, it's going to be final, definitive, and it's going to have an impact. Okay, Dan, we'll leave it there. Thank you very much for joining us from California. Thank you. You're welcome.